This is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Stephen A. Smith still on vacation. It is the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Bob Wachusen filling in for Stephen A. at one triple eight say ESPN one triple eight seven two nine three seven seven six. Kirk Morrison busy today. He'll be back with me tomorrow. So it is me solo for the next couple hours. Lots of time for telephone calls. We've got Tim Hasselback coming up at the bottom of the hour. We're certainly going to talk some baseball in hour number two and right now. And we have uh, NFL that we'll get into with Tim coming up shortly. But to me, right at the top, I start with this being kind of the middle of the work week. You're getting over the hump. Kind of tough to wake up and get to the weekend, but this is a wake-up Wednesday for some of the biggest franchises in sports. Certainly a wake-up Wednesday for a couple teams right here in New York, and a wake-up Wednesday for an NBA superstar that still hasn't quite figured out, even nine years into his career, how the business works. I'll get to that in a minute, but there has been news made today even shy of the Major League Baseball trade deadline, as one of the biggest names last night to come off of the block was Zach Britton and the Yankees, where everyone knows that they still theoretically are going to try to go out and get a starting pitcher, made a move for three minor league pitchers with a team in their own division to bolster what now looks like about the best bullpen in baseball and maybe one of the best bullpens we've seen since the Yankees back in 1996 when they had Mariano and John Wetland and they won the World Series. That's how good this bullpen is. All that being said, the Yankees still need to wake up. And I think they're wide awake, but just in case, they need to be woken to the fact that their starting rotation is still not good enough. They absolutely, positively still need to make a move before next Tuesday to get a starting pitcher. Which brings me to, I guess, the targets that they have on the board and why I'm saying they have to wake up. They have to expand their horizons. Because the guys that you hear constantly connected with the Yankees, and one of those guys, to the credit of the Boston Red Sox now off the board because Nathan Avaldi was supposed to start against the Yankees today for Tampa. Half hour before the start, he gets scratched. A guy that's got a top four whip since the end of May in the American League is now headed to Boston. So the Red Sox, who already had a better starting rotation than the Yankees, add to that rotation because Stephen Wright's hurt. Rodriguez still on the DL. He's probably coming back in a couple of weeks. But now they take Avaldi and make him their fifth starter, theoretically, once they get Rodriguez back. So you've got Chris Sale, who's probably the Cy Young winner so far this year in the American League. The only team that David Price can't pitch against is the Yankees. Rick Porcello, who's been hot and cold, but at times awesome this year. Rodriguez, who's been tremendous, and now you add Evaldi. Better starting rotation than the Yankees have, which is why the Yankees have to wake up. They have to expand their horizons. This can't be just about Jay Happ. This can't be about Cole Hamels, who has been dreadful. You need to wake up and realize how much better the Red Sox are right now overall as a team than you are, which is six games in the standings, or five after last night, and the fact that the Red Sox have a better rotation than you had before today began, and they just added to it. And the reason that I'm saying the Yankees have to wake up is I'm tying it together with the other team here in New York that really has to wake up, and that's the New York Mets. It is taken for granted in New York that the Mets, they just know they're not going to get enough for Syndergaard, they're not going to get enough for Jacob deGrom, so they're not going to trade them. And the last team in the world that they would ever trade them to would be the Yankees. There is this, you know, symbolic brick wall between the two organizations where neither would ever be willing, theoretically, to make a big deal with the other. Well, the Mets need to wake up. And they need to collectively with the Yankees wake up. Because exactly what the Yankees need is in one place, really, and one place only. And that is a top-notch, top-of-the-rotation, young, controllable, maybe not that young, but controllable pitcher. And the Mets have two of them. The only two that theoretically could be available at the trade deadline, both play in flushing. And the Yankees aren't interested in either. They're not going to realistically make an offer for at least one of those two. And the reason the Mets need to wake up is they have to open their minds to the fact that exactly what they've got is what the Yankees need, and exactly what they need is what the Yankees got. The Yankees have the prospects. 
that could be young, controllable talent that could totally reinvigorate the Mets system and reinvigorate their lineup next year. It becomes even more so a wake-up call for the Mets with the Cespedes news today. Yuena Cespedes is now going to follow through and have surgery on both of his heels. So he is going to be gone, almost best-case scenario, until the All-Star break next year. So you're without your best player for the rest of this season. The last two years have been a total waste. He's making close to $30 million the next two years. So he is on your team. He is an untradeable, immovable object. He is an anchor around your entire team. You need to hit the reset button. How do you best hit the reset button? You make a trade with the Yankees. You call up Brian Cashman, any one of the three general managers that the Mets have, John Rico obviously, calls up Brian Cashman and says, let's actually sit down and talk about this. Exactly what you need, we've got. Exactly what we need, you've got. If the only reason we don't make a trade is because of this just kind of taken for granted, we're not going to deal with each other because we can't stand seeing the other team win phobia that we both have. If that's the only thing stopping a deal from happening between these two organizations, then that is beyond stupid. It's short-sighted on the part of both. If the Yankees were ever able, not even to get DeGrom, even to get Syndergaard, if Syndergaard stays healthy, the Yankees could be the Golden State Warriors of Major League Baseball. Think about the young, controllable, affordable talent that they would have for the next minimum three years. And then you're, the Yankees have done everything they can to stay beneath the 197 threshold this year. So theoretically, they could go out and go after Manny Machado or Bryce Harper next year. They don't even need that anymore. Why do they even need that? Let's say they hold on to Glaber Torres. So you've got a lineup next year that's got Paul, uh, that's got uh, Greg Bird at first, Torres at second, Didi at short, two 50 plus home run potential guys in the outfield, Aaron Hicks in center. Sooner or later, Gary Sanchez could be back behind the plate. Who cares who plays third? So say to the Mets, Miguel Andujar, he is the centerpiece of a deal. Let's talk about him. Let's take Andujar. Let's take Justice Sheffield as the top Yankee pitching prospect. Let's take Esteban Florial, who's probably their top outfield prospect. Those three guys as the jumping off point, even a Clint Frazier. Because where are these guys going to play for the Yankees? For the next five years, there's no room for these guys to play for the Yankees. If you landed one of the two big Met pitchers, you don't need Sheffield anymore. I mean, that's an easy transition from him being your top pitching prospect to maybe DeGrom coming over as a Cy Young candidate. You stick him behind Severino, and you've got the best one-two punch in the American League. Who cares who plays third? Why do the Yankees have to have a homegrown third baseman? Who cares if Andujar has a homegrown third baseman is there or not? Let him go to Flushing. Let him go hit 25 home runs for the Mets. I mean, the Yankees, whenever they've won the World Series, they've always won it with a free agent or a pickup at third base. They won it with a Wade Boggs-Charlie Hayes combination in the 90s. They won it with A-Rod. Um, you know, they won it with Scott Brocious. They've always had a mercenary at third base. You don't have to be homegrown at every single position on the field. You also don't have to be a superstar at every single position on the field. But the Yankees better wake up and realize that even with Britain in their bullpen, their rotation is not good enough. It's not good enough. It's too big of a drop-off after Severino. As good as CC has been, as this season goes on, we'll see if he stays healthy, see how they can manage him. But they want to go for it. And it's not going to be sitting CC and giving him extra rest, giving Severino extra rest. They have to try and catch the Red Sox, because the last thing you want to do is be in a one-game wild-card playoff scenario. This is the Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. And again, the Straight Talk to the Mets is they need to hit the reset button on their organization. And they have something that nobody else in baseball has. Certainly not any of the other organizations that need to hit the reset button and basically start over. And in one fell swoop can reinvigorate their entire organization by making one move and one move alone, and they've got two guys to do it with. They can reinvigorate their organization and still have 
a clear-cut ace starting pitcher, whether it's DeGrom or Syndergaard. I'm not saying trade both of them. I'm saying trade one of them. And the team that they should be looking to trade them to is the Yankees. Because as good as the Yankee bullpen is, think about last season. And the lesson we all should have learned last season as we got to the trading deadline about the single biggest acquisition that any team made last year in terms of who ended up competing for, getting to, and then winning the World Series. And that was a big-time, number one, ace starting pitcher. The single biggest seed change we saw last year as we got to the baseball trade deadline was Verlander going to Houston. And they rode that acquisition to a world championship. If the Yankees were able to get their hands on one of these two Mets starters and were able to put him in a 1-2 combination with Severino for the next five or six years at the top of their rotation, who cares what they give up to do it? And for the Mets, by the time they actually get to the point where they would be able without trading one of these guys, to get their organization back to where they could win? How many years left do you think DeGrom and Syndergaard are going to have? DeGrom just turned 30. He's got two controllable years left after this year. How many years do you think you are away? So this is the question I ask any Met fan that doesn't want to trade one of those two guys. Here is the question I would ask you. Simple. And I would ask this to John Ricco, to any of the guys that want to answer questions. Very few seem to for the Mets these days. But anybody that wants to answer this question on the Mets' behalf. Give me the mechanism with which you improve your team if you don't deal one of those guys. There's only three ways to make your team better in pro sports. You either have the draft or a farm system. Obviously, if it's basketball or football, you are drafting and putting a player on your team. If it's hockey or uh, baseball, you get a farm system. So you're either calling talent up from your farm system. Well, who's coming up that's an impact player for the Mets? They have no impact prospects on the horizon. Peter Alonso may be the ba- first baseman of the future. He is a middling prospect, a guy that maybe when he first arrives could be a 15 to 20 home run kind of a guy. He is not projected to be a big difference maker. So There is no one on the horizon that is a franchise player coming out of the Mets system. So that's out. What are the other two ways you can improve your team? Free agency. You can go spend money. Well, who thinks the Mets are spending any money? Certainly not with Cespedes on the books. Last year, I mean, people have this fantasy about Bryce Harper and Manny Machado. Please, last year, they didn't even make offers to guys like Mike Moustakis or Eric Hosmer or maybe Arietta for the rotation. Those guys, they're just making in the teens. These aren't guys that we're talking about 25, 30, 35 million dollar difference making free agents. Those guys are like middle of the road free agents. Matt Stephen make an offer to Mike Moustakis. He went back to Kansas City, I think, for 13 million dollars because nobody even offered him a contract. So if they're not even making offers for guys like that, why does anyone think next year they're going to go out and spend big money? All right, well, now you've used up two ways you can make your team better. The farm system is not bringing any talent anytime soon, and they are not going to go out and spend a lot of money for free agents. What's the third way? You make a trade. You make a trade. You have a big-time tradable commodity, and normally teams that are as bad as the Mets don't have that. Usually, when you're as bad as the Mets, you don't have a franchise player or two that are tradable commodities. They have two of them. Wheeler might even be a borderline third. You can flip your organization by trading one of those two guys. And the team that by far makes the most sense to make that trade with is the team five miles away in the Bronx. And if you're telling me the only reason that's stopping you from making that deal is because we just can't stand to see the other guy win, it would kill us as the Mets to see the Yankees with DeGrom and pinstripes winning a World Series. Or it would kill us as the Yankees to see our young farm system go and reinvigorate the Mets. If that's the only thing that's stopping you, that is beyond stupid. That is so short-sighted, showing no faith in your own decision-making process, 
And also not acknowledging the fact that the two organizations are just in totally different places right now. Admit what you are and where you are and go do what you need to do and what's best for your organization right now. And for both organizations, that would be to do business with each other. It's not like we haven't seen it before. I'd love somebody in Chicago to tell me when Quintana went from the White Sox to the Cubs last year, did like, was it the apocalypse? I mean, did, did, did the Red Sea part? Was there a plague of flies and frogs or something? No. They did business with one another because they knew it was the right thing to do. And so to me, the Mets need to wake up. The Yankees need to wake up. And one other guy that kind of needs to wake up is DeMar DeRozan. I mean, I, I listened to the interview that he did uh, on ESPN, uh, even read some of the quotes beyond that, and I get that he is someone who feels in Toronto like he kind of gave his blood, sweat, and tears to that organization and wasn't appreciated. Well, you know what, DeMar? Welcome to professional sports. Welcome to the world of big boy sports. Okay, this is not a situation where – a general manager is going to go to you and keep you in the loop on every discussion he's having about you with other teams. And if somehow you're offended that Toronto traded you, they traded you for Kawhi Leonard. They traded you for a top five player in the NBA. They traded you for a franchise player just as LeBron James leaves the Eastern Conference and everybody's just ceding the Eastern Conference to the Celtics or maybe the Sixers. They have a chance to get a player who's better than anybody that plays for the Celtics or anybody who plays for the Sixers and who's a lot better than you. Of course they're going to make that deal. Any general manager would make that deal. Masai Ujiri could have come to you and said, I am naming my next born DeMar DeRozan Ujiri. Even if it's a girl, I'm going to name my next born DeMar DeRozan Ujiri. And he still would have been lying to you if he told you he wasn't looking to move you if some team offered him a top five player in the league. Well, that's what San Antonio was forced to offer him. Of course he's going to make that trade. Welcome to the NBA. Welcome to pro sports. That's the way it goes. So you are now going to go down to San Antonio. You're going to play basketball for the millions of dollars you're being paid to play basketball. And I admire the player that you've become. I covered DeMar DeRozan in college. I never thought he'd become a five, six, seven, eight time all-star in the NBA, a legit 20 point scorer. I never thought that he would become that good of a player. But let's also admit what he is. He was the centerpiece player along with Lowry on a team that showed that no matter how many regular season wins they racked up, kind of like Houston, when it got to the most important spot against the rival that you all knew was coming down the tracks, and when it really got to crunch time, we saw what he is, what they are as a team, and what their front office had to admit to themselves. And it seems to be something that no one in Houston is willing to admit to themselves if you're a fan of the Rockets. You know, somehow, especially with getting, getting Carmelo Anthony, which is still to me baffling, they don't want to admit to themselves that they have no chance against the Golden State Warriors as currently constituted. They're just going to kind of keep throwing points and no defense at the wall and hope it works. It's not going to work. We all know it's not going to work, but God bless. Keep going to the conference finals and getting beat and... You know, that that will be your legacy at the end of the day. Well, that was not the legacy that Masai Ujiri and, and the guys in Toronto were willing to have. They saw an opportunity to legitimately take their place at the top, not just in the regular season standings, but also maybe in the playoffs in their conference. And they took it. And I don't blame them for taking it. And if DeMar DeRozan thought for one second there was any general manager in the NBA that A, wasn't going to trade him for a Kawhi Leonard, or B, was going to be calling him every five minutes to say it was in the works. You cover all your bases if you're an executive. You tell the guy on your team he is the greatest thing in the world. You want him believing that. You want him believing that that's what you think. Because he needs to go out there and go to war with you, for you, every single night if he's on your team, especially if he's one of your top players. While at the same time, on the flip side of the coin, you're being offered Kawhi Leonard for him? Yes. You are absolutely positively going to take that deal. 
a hundred times, six days a week and twice on Sunday, you are making that deal. And if that's something that somehow surprises DeMar DeRozan, well, you know what? You've been in the NBA a long time, like nine years. Shouldn't surprise you anymore. Welcome to big boy sports. Welcome to the NBA. Sports fans, the sun is shining. The temps are rising. Summer is officially here. So grab your friends, blast some tunes, ignite those coals, because weather like this waits for no one. Kingsford Charcoal starts something. I'm Bob Oshusen, and for Stephen A. Smith, I was just giving you the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. And oh, by the way, if you're ready for a multivitamin that's actually proven to make you feel better, choose GNC. Their in-house science team combines nutrients and ingredients to deliver products that work. That means a multivitamin blend shown to work better than a basic multi. That means the highest quality formulas for your age, gender, and lifestyle. Not all multivitamins are created equal. That's why you should choose a clinically proven GNC multivitamin that makes you feel better. Save 30% on all GNC multivitamins in store and online Thursday through Saturday. Exclusions apply. See associate for details. Study results based on six weeks of use. Again, I'm Bob Oshusen, in for Stephen A. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. All right, I've got the baseball out there for you to talk about. And if you want to give us a call, you can certainly do that at one triple eight say espn I've got the basketball out there for you to talk about. You are certainly more than welcome to talk with me about that. We get to the telephones coming up a little bit later on. But when we come back, we're going to change gears and go right to football because camps are opening. Tim Hasselback. You know him from all the shows you watch on ESPN, NFL Live, um, all the fantasy shows, and he is just omnipresent when it comes to covering the NFL as one of the best analysts we've got in Bristol to talk about the NFL. He is going to join us when we come back on the other side, talk some NFL with Tim Hasselback in a moment on the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Computer, execute 12.4p operation. Optimizing algorithm. Running encryption packet alpha. Night, night. Oh, I don't feel so good. What? What is it, computer? Is it hot in here? It feels hot in here? I feel a little clammy. I should lie down or something. A computer with a virus? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. Those oysters Rockefeller were a mistake. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show here on ESPN Radio. Bob Oshusen sitting in for Stephen A. today. ESPN Radio was presented by Progressive Insurance with insurance for cars, home, boat, motorcycles, RVs, commercial vehicles. It's 1-800-PROGRESSIVE and Progressive.com. We'll get back to the telephones. We're going to get some calls in. We've set the table. We've got baseball on the trade deadline, obviously, to talk about. DeMar DeRozan, Kawhi Leonard, all of the drama still going on in the NBA. But the drama now turns to the football field as players are returning to camp and all the contract situations that all, always seem to kind of bubble up and come to a boil as players get set for training camp. Certainly a topic as well, and kind enough to spend a few minutes talking NFL with us is one of our experts. You see him all the time on SportsCenter, NFL Live, the fantasy shows all over ESPN as well. Tim Hasselback joins us here on the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Tim, how are you? Doing great, Bob. How are you? Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Let's start with some of the headline-making controversy of the past few days. You are the decision makers in Atlanta. How are you dealing with Julio Jones? Um, quite honestly, I'm not giving him a new deal. I mean, he's got three years left on the deal, and and so when I look at that, I, I think, look, you've been making about 16 million a year for the last few years, which would, to be quite honest with you, put you up, you know, in top wide receiver money, you know, on today's contracts. You know, the ones that have most recently been done, like Antonio Brown, like DeAndre Hopkins, like Jarvis Landry, and so. I think the way you have to look at it is say, we've compensated you fairly. You have three years left on a deal, and you signed a five-year extension. And, um, you know, that was kind of the price of of getting the money up front like you did because he's been paid handsomely the past few years. How do you think his camp then plays? Because I agree with you. We were on yesterday. I said the exact same thing. He got the security of those years bought yeah. out for a front-loaded contract, $47 million guaranteed, and now with three years left on the deal, he wants to act like he's an impending free agent. You're not. Mm -hmm. Live up to the terms of the deal and show up. But having said that, if the team really stands firm 
Is he just going to eat these fines and have to sooner or later accept the deal that he's playing on and come back? Or is there some recourse from his side? Do you think he'd actually sit out games? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, listen, it would cost him a lot of money, and I know he's made a lot of money. You referenced the guarantees that that he already had. Um, Look, I mean, you know, forty grand a day gets expensive, even for somebody you know like Julio. And then, obviously, once you start getting into the season, it gets worse. I don't know where his mindset is on it. I I don't know if you know he's looking at it from the standpoint of. Look, hey, I'm underpaid, and, and I'm and I'm willing to sit out. He's got a lot of time left on the deal. I'm just not sure what, not sure what his leverage is. Ultimately, I think what happens is that, um, you know, he's one of these guys that even though he's an elite receiver, he's really been a you know no drama guy, and because of that, I think that the team appreciates that. And I think that one of the things you can do is you can maybe incentivize the last couple of years of, his, of this deal. You can maybe move some money, um, you know, cut to, for him to get it sooner or whatever. You can do something to kind of, you know, meet in the middle a little bit just to make the deal a little bit better, make him feel like you're trying to do right by him. But but ultimately, the three years left on a contract, I, I don't know how you just you rip it up. Do you think – and this is the world you used to live in as a quarterback, although you weren't paid quite as handsomely as the uh, the Matt Ryans and Kirk Cousins of the mm-hmm. world are not being paid. But do you think, having been in an NFL locker room, that at some point there's going to be some market correction for the gap between what the top quarterbacks are making and what the best players at other positions are making? Will there be enough disharmony in some of these locker rooms that at some point that gap's going to have to close a little bit so that all these other guys playing all these other positions aren't just resentful of everybody in the NFL that plays quarterback? Yeah. Um, no, I don't think there's going to be a correction. Um, there's a reason why those guys are paid more. It's the hardest position. Man. No Things doubt. I, I remember, remember guys like Michael Bennett say, oh, you know, want to be paid like these quarterbacks are just as valuable as these pass rushers. Uh, the thing I would say is, like, look, if you want to be paid like a quarterback, then then learn how to throw. I mean, like, plain and simple, like, that, that's the deal. Like, I, to me, you know, Julio, as good as he is, and I've heard people be like, oh, you know, who's more valuable to the team, Julio or Matt Ryan? Uh, Matt Ryan is. Yes. Look, Julio is great, but Julio, on a really good Sunday, might touch the ball six times. Like, the quarterback touches it every offensive snap. And he's making a decision in the run game. He's making a decision in the passing game. Like, uh, and there aren't in, in the drop off from Matt Ryan to whoever your next replacement player is is really significant. You know, and look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that that Julio Jones isn't significantly better than Muhammad Sanu. He is, but the drop off from from Julio to Muhammad Sanu is not as great as the drop off from Matt Ryan to whoever else you would have in his place. It just isn't. And so quarterbacks are getting paid that way and have been getting paid, you know, the the premier money for a reason, and I don't think that ever changes. Uh, you're one of two teams in the NFL. You either got one or you're looking for one as far as quarterbacks are concerned. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have one, then you're not winning, at least not winning with any consistency. Um, I, I agree with you completely. Along those lines, Jared Goff took a big step forward last year. With all of the money that the Rams have spent, are you buying the Rams literally and figuratively? Because that's what they try to do. They're trying to go out and buy yeah. a team. Are you buying what they have done philosophically by just loading up with a lot of mercenaries? Well, listen, they've got a really good coach, and they've got very good players, you know, in terms of what guys have achieved in the NFL so far. So, you know, obviously they just redid Todd Gurley's deal. He's a proven player. And you look at some of the stuff that they've done on the defensive side of the ball – we got a bunch of proven players. I, I think the, the the concern I would have for them is, and it's really mainly on the defensive side, is that not everybody can be a playmaker. You know, the deal with defense is defenses that are good are are, are defenses that are you know kind of are selfless. Like people understand. Like, look, part of my job is to eat up a double team so that the linebacker can go run and make a play. You know, I don't know who the leader is on that defense um, to kind of to, to be the one that, that is the communicator of, look, we're, we're not a selfish group, and it's not about who's making the plays. It's about 
you know, us all out here working together. You know, they, they traded away their middle linebacker signal caller who's been a leader for them, and now they just have a bunch of big personalities on that defense. I'm a little bit concerned about that. But if that comes together, then, yeah, look, that's a, that's a really good team with a really good staff. You know, if you draw that parallel to one of your old teams, the Giants, two years ago it did come together, and they were a top team in terms mm-hmm. of points against. They bought a defense, and it worked. Last year, that same defense totally, from a chemistry standpoint and from a performance standpoint, fell apart, and they looked like a bought mercenary defense. Mm-hmm. So, you know, is this a sustainable plan? Because with the Giants, it wasn't. Yeah, because, well, and I think the reason, you know, part of the reason it is then is that you have these different personalities. Look, most guys, let me just ask you, Akeep Tlaib, does Akeep Tlaib, the, does, does he ever strike you as a guy that wants to be a role player? You yeah. know, does he, is he a guy that wants, or is he the guy that, like, he wants to take chances, he wants to be the one to be able to go and make plays, right? He wants to go do that. Well, then you also have a safety that's, uh, you know, playing on a franchise, you know, tag. Like he wants to go make plays too because he wants to get a new deal. And you got a defensive tackle that wants a new deal, so he's not worried about you know eating up a double team. He's concerned about picking a side and trying to make a play. And 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 you just go on and on and on down the, down the line. It's like, well, that, that doesn't it doesn't work that way. Like defense doesn't work that way. It, de- defense starts with like alignment, assignment. Like in part of sometimes your assignment is not making the play so that somebody else can. And and so I, that's the part for me where I just I wonder if it'll work. And kind of to your point, Bob, like if it does, how sustainable is it? Um, along those lines then, I mean, there are so many interesting storylines, especially a quarterback, but also teams that have Super Bowl aspirations that might have question marks at that position. Jacksonville got on the doorstep last year. Everybody knows their quarterback obviously is a major question mark. Patrick Mahomes taken over in Kansas City, so on and so forth. All of those old veterans that still are performing at an incredibly high level. Brady last year went in the MVP. So when you look wide-angle lens, be a stockbroker. Are there some stocks out there that people right now are selling high? Who would you think you could buy low right now that might be a, a surprise? Like when you, as you kind of look at well, as the so, season so, approaches. Yeah, yeah. So here's what I would say. Like you referenced Pat Mahomes. Listen, he has a ton of ability. He was a really raw player coming out of high school, very unrefined. And so, look, he's gone to a situation where he's got the best, you know, probably quarterback coach in the, you know, in the world, and Andy Reid as his head coach. And so. You know, I think you look at that situation and, you, and and I see everyone so excited about him. And I think there's going to be a bunch of wow plays. We're going to be a bunch of sports center plays for, for Pat Mahomes. But but how many bad plays are we going to get out of him? You know, part of playing quarterback is just eliminating mistakes. Yep. So, you know, that's the one for me. I feel like people are probably a little too high on Pat Mahomes. Just th- that's my that's my take on I mean, the excitement around him is so high. It's, um, and so that's surprising to me. Right, and, and then, real, yeah, uh, on a buy low guy, Bob. Like, how about the guy that he re- that, that that he's replacing, Alex Smith going to the Redskins? Like, Alex Smith wins more games than he loses. He doesn't make a ton of mistakes. He's been a very productive player for a long time, and he might, he has a chance, I, in my estimation, to maybe take his third team to the postseason. But that would be a ridiculous accomplishment for a guy who I think has been one of the more underappreciated players for a long time. Hey, real quick, got 30 seconds left. Selfishly, I want mm-hmm. your take on the Jets. They're my, my team, obviously, here in New York, calling them mm-hmm. on the radio. So how quickly does Sam Darnold, do you think, get in there to become the quarterback, and how good do you think he can be? I think Sam can be a very good starter. Um, how quickly do I think he gets in there? I, I think that uh, I think we'll see him probably sometime after week four. I, I think it'll be that, that soon. I think McCown starts. You know, how healthy he can stay for how long, I think, ends up probably dictating when we see Sam. Love it. Tim, thanks a million for the time. I appreciate it. All right, Bob. See you. All right, that's Tim Hasselback joining us here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Bob was choosing in. Your phone call is coming up. Obviously, now NFL is on the table, as well as the baseball trade deadline, the NBA. A lot to talk about. We'll hit the phones when we come back on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Bob Shoes and in for Stephen A. on the Stephen A. Smith Show here on ESPN Radio. one say espn That's one 
888-957-3776. Get to the phones in just a second. We've got football, baseball, basketball all on the, ta- on the table now. And sports fans, the sun is shining. The temperatures are rising. Summer is officially here. So grab your friends, blast some tunes, and ignite those coals. Because weather like this waits for no one. Kingsford Charcoal, start something. And the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio also brought to you by Triple Action Protection for Optimal Engine Performance from Shell V-Power Nitro Plus Premium Gasoline. Again, Bob Wischusen sitting in for Stephen A. We've got some open lines at 888-SAY-ESPN. Give us a call. Let's go to Angel in New York. Joins us here on ESPN Radio. What's up, Angel? Did we lose Angel? Angel going once. Angel going twice. I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, now I got you, Angel. Thanks. Yeah, sorry about that. So you thank you for having me, Bob. I appreciate it. Thanks um, for calling. One thing I w- so one thing I wanted to make clear, I'm a Mets fan, but I got nothing against the Yankees. I root for the Yankees. I like the Yankees. So when you touch that theme about, you know, the Mets not wanting to trade with the Yankees, I, I don't care who the Mets trade with as long as it makes them better. Um, one thing I will say, though, I'm okay with the Mets trading the Grom because he's 30. I would never, ever, in a million years right now, trade Noah Syndergaard. He's 25. He's young. If we trade Noah Syndergaard, all you're going to be doing in the next couple of years is trying to replace Noah Syndergaard. He has a lightning arm. He has to work on being healthy for one full season. But I would never trade Noah Syndergaard. And another thing that I'll have to say is I feel like the last couple of years, injuries have really been a bug for us. So we need to speak to Joanna Cespedes, Jay Bruce, Todd Frazier, Michael Conforto, all these guys, your professional athletes, go to the gym, do what you got to do. I know it's a long season, but try to stay healthy because I feel like if these guys all have one full season season together and they can have the rhythm together, we'll be a productive baseball team that will be in the hunt as we construct it now. I truly believe that. That's optimistic. Uh, back to your original point, Angel. Thanks for the call. I would not say never to either of those two guys. I can understand because DeGrom is controllable for the next two years, but he is 30 years old. There is that, you know, kind of push and pull of in spite of the fact that you financially control him for the rest of this season and two more years arbitration eligible before he becomes a free agent. You start to ask yourself, what kind of a pitcher will he be when he's 33, 34, 35 years old? And how many years and how much money do you then offer him? That's fair. Syndergaard younger? Certainly understand that. Turns out, though, at least to this point, DeGrom's been way more durable. And let's face it, DeGrom's better. He's been arguably the best pitcher in baseball this year. So I can make an argument for both guys. If I'm the Mets, what I do is... Put them both out there and say, hey, highest bidder, who do you like? Which guy tickles your fancy? Bring me the offers. And if you get the right one, I pull the trigger. Because this organization needs a complete and total reset. Nate joins us next here on ESPN Radio on the Stephen A. Smith Show. What's up, Nate? Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the Zach Britton trade. Sure. I'm also a little concerned because Zach Britton, is really, after the surgery, has really not been that good. And you traded three pretty good prospects for him, so I want to know what you have to, just what you have to say about that. Well, all right, thanks for the call. I appreciate it, but he has been pretty good. I mean, this year he actually has been, at least recently, looking like Zach Britton. And the reason that they're trading for him is they're not convinced that they're going to go out and get a difference-making starter. So what they're trying to do is make a strength stronger. And if you think about that bullpen now, you could have your starting pitcher literally in a big spot go three innings. You go three innings, and you could be fine. You have three legitimate closers. Britton, Batances, and Chapman back to back to back. It's almost like you are bringing your closer in collectively starting in the seventh inning. So that does potentially minimize the fact that your starting rotation is still without a big arm. I'm Bob Wischusen, and for Stephen A. Smith, another hour to play with, and Buster Olney joins us, our ESPN Baseball Insider. We come back for hour number two, ESPN Radio. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Number two of the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Stephen A. off this week. Bob Wischusen in. 
one triple eight say ESPN one eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. Promise we'll get back to the phones. We've got some open lines. If you're on hold, stay right there. If not, we've got some room. Give a call, and we will get back to the calls coming up a little bit later on. ESPN Radio presented by Progressive Insurance. Commercial insurance through Progressive protects your business and your dream. Choose from over thirty coverage options at progressivecommercial.com. Well. Our next guest is one of the best we've got at ESPN in terms of covering baseball, one of our senior baseball insiders, and you can check out the Baseball Tonight podcast with Buster Olney. New episodes daily. Subscribe, rate, and review on the ESPN app or Apple podcast. The aforementioned Buster Olney joins us now here on ESPN Radio on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Buster, Bob O'Shoes, and how are you? Bob, good to talk with you. How are you doing? I am doing great. You know, it's funny. Talk about a blast from the past. I first came back from my first job in Miami. 95, 96, and was sent by the radio station I was working with at that time down, you know, to do like a little relief work for uh, the regulars at spring training. Were you covering the Yankees for the Times then? Do I have that right? No, I was covering the Orioles in 95 and 96. I covered the Mets in 97, which I think might have. I don't know if you ever made it over that way. And then I, I started I covering did. the Yankees in 98. 98 you went, and that was the Times you were writing for, and you covered the Yankees then. Right, for four years. Yeah, For four years. I just, I, I got to thinking kind of nostalgically about how I got as my first gig back in New York an up-close look at how hardened baseball beat writers would cover a team like the Yankees, team like the Mets, team like the Red Sox, like one of the big, you know, household names in the sport – kind of in the wake of what happened with the Daily News this past week. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about where the business is at. You've obviously made the very successful transition from being a print guy to not joining us at ESPN, but a little part of my childhood of growing up as a New York sports fan and then a little part of my professional life of being a diehard New York tabloid reader died this week. Oh, no doubt about it. You know, and, and a lot of the guys who got bad news this week, I mean, John Harper had, was always someone that who I aspired to be, you know, sort of that uh, uh, someone, who, as you say, sort of a, a New York type uh, beat reporter and, you, you know, you, the intensity and the scrutiny and all that John brings to it. And Peter Body was uh, on the Yankee beat the first year that I covered the Yankees for the New York Times and, and you got to know him and it, it – you know, it just it crushes you, and you hate where the the business is going. And and I do think it's reflected overall in the, in the quality of the, you know, the the reporting that we're seeing across the board. When you have less competition, it means you got more stuff that's not great. And so to see those guys out of work, really, it's awful. Yeah, it's the the guys that do it and do it well, and those two do it really well, as you did and still do, and so many that still are gainfully employed. If you're covering a baseball team and you're covering it well, that's a long job. That's a lot of hours of dedication of being at the ballpark at 1 or 2 in the afternoon and going home at 1 o'clock in the morning to do the job right. Yeah, uh, and especially in New York. Uh, you know, the amount of hours required to cover. Oh. When I started covering the Yankees, covering the George Steinbrenner team, you know, I remember spring trainings where you'd show up at 7.30 in the morning and then at 11 o'clock at night you're waiting to see if George is going to merge after yelling at Brian and Cashman. Uh, yeah. You know, I after told people, they like, lose a spring training game to the Red Sox. <laughs> yeah, I would go down to Tampa and I would come back and not only would I not be tanned, like I would be paler than right. when I left to go down there. And people would say, weren't you at spring training? Look, where you I'm like, you don't get it. Like, they open the clubhouse at 8 o'clock in the morning. You are standing around making sure that George doesn't, like, emerge from some broom closet and yep. say something, and all of a sudden it's on the back pages, and you're going home at 6, 7 o'clock at night. I mean, it's yeah. an old, and I was leaving before the beat writers. I had to file a few 30, 45 minute long reports to a couple of phoners. I mean, the amount of work that I did paled in comparison to what a beat writer does. Yeah, I remember uh, Joel Sherman, uh, there was a documentary uh, that was done on baseball beat writing in New York at that time, and Joel Sherman compared it to like a military tour. Like you would you would sign up, and, and obviously he was he was kidding. He didn't mean that literally, but he just talked about the amount of time that was required uh, and the amount of, and you're right, you'd get calls from friends who were in the area, hey, I see the Yankees are around. Uh, you want to go hang out and have dinner? No, I'm sorry. I have no social life. I go right. nowhere. I do nothing but wait for George Steinbrenner to call me back. Yeah, I've got 12 minutes to give you at the media buffet if you want to have dinner. That's about it. 
Buster exactly only, hey, right. nobody does it better. Obviously, you are as dialed in as anyone as far as the trade deadline. We're going to get to that in a moment. Um, the Yankees making a move. The Red Sox making maybe, you know, kind of that counter move earlier today. We'll get to that in a second. But what did you make of the uh, hater reception from the fans in Milwaukee? Did that bother you? Did that crawl under your skin at all? Yeah, it did. Uh, I was really surprised, and far be it for me to tell how people had to react. But I, I given the how vile uh, his tweets were, and the nature of the the racism and the homophobia, I was absolutely, you know, those those took your breath away when you saw them. And I, I thought when he'd go back on the field, and I've been you know covered teams where players had come back from some legal issues. And for the most part, you get the non-response. And I thought that's what would happen in Milwaukee. And from what I understand, not only did you know did he get a standing ovation from some fans in Milwaukee in that first game, but it also happened in the second game, even after there was a, a big national response to what had gone on. So absolutely, it was a surprise. Yeah, it just it was a little stomach turning, I think, with the context because I I drew a parallel to other examples that we've seen where. I mean, often with fans, it's just, are you in my laundry? And if you're wearing my laundry, I love you. Like when everybody in baseball was killing Barry Bonds and people were throwing syringes at the guy from the stands, he, every time he came up in San Francisco, would get a standing ovation. But this, to me, feels different than performance-enhancing drugs. Like this is vile, this is hate rhetoric, this... This, to me, went a little bit beyond the line of, you're wearing my laundry, therefore I'm going to give you a standing ovation regardless of what's happened in your past. My guess is is that I'm going to see Josh in spring training, and you know my hope would be, and I'll uh, talk to him obviously at that time, would be that I would say to him, hey, that was uh, that was great that you went back to your old high school and spoke to the students there and told them why you were wrong and how ridiculous it was and how ignor- ignorant your tweets were. And that he does a series of those events yep. during the winter time. Um, Good point. You know, short of that, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I tell people all the time. You, you and I both know a lot of things about a lot of players that we can't ever report. And I always tell friends, you make decisions about uh, people that you celebrate and write about and and uh, publicize based on what you know. It doesn't mean you're always saying out loud what you know. But you can make those decisions. And I thought the non-response was the way that fans would go in Milwaukee. It's a good point. Buster Olney with us here on ESPN, one of our senior baseball insiders. All right, now to the trade deadline arriving a little earlier. I mean, some of the biggest names, like Brad Hand, like Avaldi earlier today, Britain to the Yankees last night, um, have gone ahead of the trade deadline. Anything that has surprised you? And what do you think maybe of the return on the investment, say, of Britain to the Yankees, Familia? Did the Mets get enough? What, what's been your overall take in the deals that have gone down so far? that generally speaking, it is a soft market for difference-making players, which is why you're seeing teams step out. Look, the the Dodgers, with uh, the acquisition of Manny Machado, uh, Andrew Freeman, who heads up their baseball operations, typically does not like to step out and pay a, a higher price in prospects in a midseason deal for a rental, and Machado's going to be a free agent in the fall. But I think the Dodgers recognize, look, there's not going to be a lot of opportunities to go out and get someone who can make a difference. I think that's exactly what happened with the Yankees. They were scouring and searching and looking for a starting pitcher who could be someone who you'd feel comfortable starting against the the Red Sox or the Astros in a big series uh, in October. And that guy isn't necessarily out there. And so I think that what they decided was, you know what? Uh, maybe we're not going to get a DeGrom or Bumgarner for a Game 2 start, but maybe in Game 2 of a seven-game series against the Astros or the Red Sox, we're going to do a bullpen game, and we're going to run out seven great relievers. Um, the, the lack of impact-type players available in the trade market, I think, has been jumping out, and part of the reason why the teams are moving early is because of, uh, of that. Odds to you Machado stays in L.A.? Uh, close to zero. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, they have Corey Seager coming back, the shortstop, Justin Turner, the third baseman, who's been their best player the last couple of years. He's got two years left on his deal. And I'm absolutely convinced that there is a room in Philadelphia with Manny Machado's <laughs> name etched on the door, and they've been piling up cash behind there because all the members of the Philadelphia front office uh, were people who used to work for the Orioles when they drafted and developed Manny when he was younger. How many teams were in on Britain? 
Did it surprise you the Yankees got him for the price they paid? And how much of what the Yankees did with Britain was just playing defense against some of those other teams that were in there on him, like the Red Sox? And I think that there's no question that's part of it. And, you know, to put a percentage on it, you know, it's, you know, 25, 30 percent. Look, uh, the Astros last year, A.J. Hinch, the manager, did an incredible job of navigating his way through the end of the ALCS against the Yankees and through the World Series without a, uh, a you know an established closer after Ken Giles lost that job. That's a hard journey to take again, a second time. And that's why the Astros were involved in the conversations on Britain, and, and, and you know, the Yankees certainly were aware of that, that just about every contender was in on Britain. And I know that within the Yankees' front office, within the organization, the thought was, look, if we're going to get this guy, then we probably have to do what the Dodgers did on Machado and we'll have to pay the extra 20% for the rental. It's not something typically that Brian Cashman likes to do, but I think if you wanted the player, you had to take the extra step. And I, you know, I talked to folks with other teams on the return that the Orioles got, and I basically got back. It was solid. You know that that was the general perception of the pitchers that uh, the Baltimore got. And and I think that there's this perception that if you don't get say a guy that's quote unquote a top five prospect in a team system, then maybe they got over on you. But I heard Brian Cashman talk about this. I've heard guys like you talk about this that know more about it than I do. The Yankees system seems so deep that if they're giving you three guys and maybe the best prospect is their quote-unquote ninth best prospect in their system, well, the ninth best prospect in the Yankees system might be the third, second best prospect in someone else's system. It seems like they have such a wealth of talent that they are still giving you a return on your investment, even if it's just three guys they're afraid they can't keep on the 40-man before the Rule 5 draft. 100%. And on top of that, Generally speaking, the return that teams are getting for these two-month rentals, two-and-a-half-month rentals, has absolutely dropped uh, precipitously, I think especially in the last two years after the Yankees got Glaber Torres for Roldis Chapman. If you look at what the Arizona Diamondbacks gave up last year for J.D. Martinez at a time, everybody knew J.D.'s a good hitter, but teams are just not willing to pay a lot. So if you're the Orioles and you get a guy – um, you know, the, if you get pitchers who you think have a chance to pitch in the big leagues, you know, be even a number three, number four type starter, and that's what the Orioles seem to have gotten, then you're probably doing pretty well for a two and a half month rental. You know, to the Mets, living in New York, following the insanity that is what has happened to them this year and partially what they've done to themselves, how they've just mucked up the UNS Cespedes situation, and now he's done maybe till the All-Star break next year. Uh, I open the show by talking about, at least in part, with the Mets. That is an organization that, to me, needs a complete reset button hit. They need to reset the organization. And... If you look at the three ways you have available to you to improve in pro sports your team, you have a farm system or a draft, depending on what the sport is. Well, the Mets' barren farm system does not seem to have anybody on the horizon coming up to help them. You can spend money. You can go out and, via free agency, bring in different players. Well, no one that follows the Mets expect them to spend any significant money. Or you can make a trade. And they are the rare example of an awful team that happens to have two, maybe three, huge, tradable franchise chips. So if you operate from the standpoint of they have to hit the reset button, they aren't going to spend a lot of money, and their farm system is not going to be where they're going to get the talent from, would you, if you were the Mets, even if you have a new GM on the horizon next year, trade either a DeGrom or a Syndergaard before the deadline? No question about it. And I think you laid it out exactly perfectly. I've been screaming about this for six weeks, that they needed to, at the very least, go through an earnest and aggressive process in which they were exchanging proposals with other teams to see what was possible, in part because of what we talked about. The market so lacks difference makers. And you had a potential to to put a, a DeGrom out there where you could have had probably six, seven, eight teams that would have been clamoring for a shot, and you don't know what you necessarily would have walked away with. Maybe it would have been a huge haul, and I'm talking about in the past tense because I think at this point it it becomes really difficult just in terms of a process for the Mets to actually trade someone like DeGrom at this point because you 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 do want to have the preparation. You do want to do all the proper scouting. You do want to get all those uh, ducks in order 
Uh, and that's something that, you know, the Mets for sure, in terms of pushing the reset and putting themselves in a better position to win moving forward, that absolutely is a step that they should have taken. Because you know teams like the Padres, the Brewers, uh, the Braves, the Yankees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they would have been all in on a difference-making player like Jacob deGrom can be. And it feels like yet another missed opportunity. Well, having said that, I kind of started the show with, and you bring a perspective to this, unlike most, because in spite of the fact that you are now someone that covers the sport in totality for ESPN, as you said, you were once a Met beat writer, and you were a Yankee beat writer. So you got to look behind the curtain at the culture of both teams. Yep. And... There is this kind of philosophical brick wall in New York that neither team can make a big deal with the other because neither team can stand to see the other team have success. And to me, if you took that out of it, if you took the Yankees and put Texas Rangers uniforms on them and took all of the New York versus New York vitriol out of it, the Yankees have exactly what the Mets need and the Mets have exactly what the Yankees need. If the only reason that these two sides don't come together to me and at least have a realistic conversation about what the Yankees would have to pay to get a DeGrom or Syndergaard and how the Mets could completely remake their organization with what the Yankees might be willing to give up to get a guy they could control for the next three or four years and would be very affordable for them and wouldn't hit the 197 mark and wouldn't reset the clock and all of the goals that they were trying to accomplish. I mean, they could become the Golden State Warriors of Major League Baseball if they added a DeGrom or Syndergaard to that team, in my opinion. If the only reason they don't get to the get, get together at the table and at least have a conversation is because we can't stand to see the other team win, to me that's beyond stupid and beyond short-sighted. Is there any chance that the two New York teams might actually get on the phone with one another and have a conversation about one of those two pitchers? I would be surprised if that conversation hasn't already taken place where Brian Cashman spoke with somebody with the Mets uh, at some point this summer and just asked about it, just to check in because he's going to check the box, and I'm sure that everybody involved probably knows that the chances of a deal happening are not good. I mean, let's face it, they couldn't work out a deal with Jay Bruce <laughs> Last year at a time when the Mets were just dumping his salary. Yes, you know, I don't think anyone would expect that they could work out with something for DeGrom. And I totally agree with your perspective. Uh, on you know, If that's all that's holding the Mets back from making a deal that could benefit the organization, it is really dumb. And it's not progressive. And it's not in keeping with how teams are run these days where the only question is, does it make us better? And there is a chance that they're going to be better. Instead, you, you fear for the Mets that what they're going to do, having been pressured now by uh, DeGrom's agent, is that they will instead decide, well, you know what, uh, let's keep him around. We'll give him a long-term extension. And by the time Jacob DeGrom, or excuse me, by the time the Mets are good and relevant again, he potentially could be on the downslide, on uh, the downslope of his career. Yep. That makes no sense. I said the exact same thing. I mean, by the time the Mets realistically not spending any money, with a farm system that probably has their best hope for prospects, say, 2020, 2021, 2022, by the time they finally come up and have an impact, what's Jacob DeGrom going to be at that point? He's going to be 33, 34 years old. They probably won't even spend the money to keep him. So I, I could not agree with you more. Now, having said all that, are the Yankees done? Or, I mean, if, if you cross the DeGrom Syndergaard option off the list, do you think that just because they have Britain and now they've got like 75 relievers and eight closers, do they take <laughs> the tact that, all right, let's just go out there and roll the dice with a J-Hap, give up what we have to give up to get a guy like that, bring him in, we'll add a pitcher, but it's not going to be a real difference maker. Yeah, and, and I think that that's mostly what's left in the marketplace. And at some point, the prices will drop enough. Uh, and apparently the you know the Blue Jays have lowered their asking price on J Hap, but you know the Mike Fires that type of guy. There are a lot of those guys, and and I expect that there'll be a bunch of them that will move. And it wouldn't surprise me if the Yankees would wind up with one of them. And I also think that they will take a strong look at the catching market. Brian Cashman told reporters today that uh, it wouldn't surprise him if Gary Sanchez is out for four weeks. And because yep. of how rosters are put together, I mean, let's face it, that means probably he's going to be activated after the September 1 date and rosters open up. It would make sense for the for the uh, Yankees to add someone like a Martin Maldonado, a good defensive catcher, uh, someone here before the trade deadline. 
Buster only with us here on the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Back to the phone calls in just a moment, but just a minute or two more with Buster. So if uh, if there's still some names out there to be dealt, talked about the Yankees, Red Sox making the move for Rivaldi. What else do you think is imminent, and what else do you think could happen at the deadline? Who else do you think could be the most active teams and who's on the move? Boy, uh, I, I think basically all the contenders, the Dodgers are going to add a reliever. I do think Houston will add a reliever. Um, because as we get closer to the deadline, I think you're going to see some of the sellers try to execute salary dumps. Um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if you see a bunch of those guys move. Toronto's got like three relievers they're ready to go with. Seung Noan O, uh, John Axford, I think Curtis Granderson gets moved to a contender at some point. There are going to be a lot of smaller type deals before we hit the market. And, and one thing, just to double back on the Mets a little bit, uh, mm-hmm. You know, I think that one thing, and I agree with you, they need to take an overall look at how they do things. And first and foremost, they need to get a linear chain of command. What a difference it made for the Yankees organization when Brian Cashman, you know, got the trust of the Steinbrenner family and was allowed to put, uh, you know, a, 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 a structure in place for the organization where you didn't have a situation like you did 20 years ago where in a given day George's driver could have more power than <laughs> Brian Cashman did. Agreed they completely. finally got into a workable situation yes. and with the Mets, Omar Minaya, you know. Uh, no, you're right. You know how these things work. When you are making a call about a Jacob deGrom or a Noah Syndergaard, that's not a conference call with like five different opinions on the call. There is one voice, and that one voice has to be the clear leader of the organization organization that has the final say over whether or not you're going to make a franchise changing move like that or not 100 percent, and they have to fix that and get it so we don't have situations like we had last weekend we're on saturday you had mickey calloway the manager having to answer for what cesped has said the night before that's like blaming a second lieutenant for things that are going on with the generals buster you're the best thanks a million for the time thanks bob I appreciate it. That's Buster Olney. Again, check out the Baseball Tonight podcast with Buster. New episodes daily. Subscribe, rate, and review on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. The baseball season rolls along. Tune in tonight. Jose Altuve and the Astros visit the Rockies, presented by Vivid Seats. Coverage begins at 8 Eastern on ESPN Radio, ESPNRadio.com, and the ESPN Radio app. And if you're ready for a multivitamin that's actually proven to make you feel better, choose GNC. Their in-house science team combines nutrients, ingredients to deliver products that work. That means a multivitamin blend shown to work better than a basic multi. That means the highest quality formulas for your age, gender, and lifestyle. Not all multivitamins are created equal. That's why you should choose a clinically proven GNC multivitamin that makes you feel better. Save 30% on all GNC multivitamins in store and online Thursday through Saturday. Exclusions apply. See associate for details. Study results based on six weeks of use. Again, I'm Bob Wischusen. In for Stephen A. on the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. one say espn one Your reaction to what Buster had to say and anything else you want to bring up when we come back on ESPN Radio. I'm a squeaky toy, and I've got one job, getting chomped on by this little ankle sniffer. So pardon me for feeling inept compared to Geico, who does so much more. Like, while I'm getting slobbered on, Geico is creating cool technology like their mobile app, which lets people pay their bills or file a claim. Plus, Geico is the fastest-growing auto insurer for the last 10 years. Is it too much for me to ask for one more feature? Fast and friendly claim service like Geico, maybe? Oh, great. I'm getting buried again. Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Speaking of 1-800-Flowers, surprise a friend or loved one today with a bouquet from 1-800-Flowers.com. When you order a dozen multicolored roses for only $29.99, you'll get another dozen absolutely free. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. one 729 3776 its is 1-888-888. 729-3776. That's one triple eight. Say ESPN. Bob Wachusen on for Stephen A. Another half hour to go till the top of the hour. Then I'm back tomorrow and Friday with Kirk Morrison. But flying solo today and talking to Kenny, who gives us a call here on ESPN Radio. Hey, Kenny. How you making out, Bob? I'm doing great. I look, look, look forward to seeing you again soon on the Jet Rock You know who I am. Ah, uh, you're a diehard. Oh yeah, listen. Uh, well, not, not not on the Jets yet, but I'm also a big Mets fan. And basically, with the starting pitching that seems to be in place, 
what direction would you go with this team with the starting pitching? Would you hold on to these chips right now and just fix the bullpen and the, and the, uh, the hitting? How do you fix it? If you don't trade either DeGrom or Syndergaard, how do you fix it? Where we live in, you, uh, you got the two big targets out there in the China and Hawkeye. You got to <laughs> give them a blank check and go from there. <laughs> that, that's pie in the sky. That's a great idea. But for an organization that last year didn't even make an offer to guys like Eric Hosmer or Mustakis or Lorenzo Cain, I mean, what what would give you any hope that they're going to go out there and write a blank check for a a Harper or a Machado or somebody like that? Well, why would you think they would ever spend that kind of money? Because this is the first time in years where we're not even in August yet, and the stadium is going to be empty. And you know, basically, they got to say to us, "Okay, if we spend the money." We should make money, not take the approach we did the last few years. I know they went to the World Series a couple of years ago, and, you know, that might have been a bad thing back then because if they think that they that is going to ride on their laurels. But with this thing in pitching, it's the agency, and, and they have to know this. Well, I'm sure they do, but spend the money. I compl- Thanks a lot for the call, Kenny. we got some open lines, by the way, at Triple Eight say espn Triple eight seven two nine three seven seven six. So give us a call if you'd like. I totally agree. I mean, if you told me that you had a team that showed absolutely no inclination to spend big money since three years ago, and they signed you on a Cespedes, what money had they spent since then? They brought Jay Bruce back when nobody else really was offering him a contract, and they gave him again like that middle of the road thirteen million dollar a year deal, but. Everybody else, for the most part, of this team's low cost. All they do over and over again is throw, you know, veterans up against the wall and see what sticks. They tried it with Adrian Gonzalez. They're trying it with Jose Batista. I mean, that's that's what they do. So it, everything is about the budget. If you told me that they were then going to adopt that philosophy of blank check, let's go sign some guys. Yes, sign me up. I'm in. The reason that I would. If I were looking as objectively as I possibly could at the Mets, say you have to trade DeGrom or Syndergaard, I am going on the assumption they're not going to do that. I'm going on the assumption they're not going to go out and spend a whole bunch of money on the free agent market for guys that cost, you know, 250 to 350 million dollars. I mean, Yoenis Cespedes is probably out until minimum the All Star break next season, and they owe him close to 30 million dollars a year for the next two years. And the Mets seem to be a kind of an organization where what they do is they just spend big money on one guy. And if it doesn't work out with that one guy, well, we gave it a shot with that one guy. Kind of the Pittsburgh Pirates philosophy. We're going to spend big on a guy. If it doesn't work out, well, we gave it a shot. Whereas the Yankees have a contract in Jacoby Ellsbury that's not even that far off what the Mets spent on Cespedes. It's about $6 million or so less, probably, than what the Mets are giving Cespedes, but not a huge downgrade from what they're giving Cespedes. Jacoby Ellsbury's got a couple years left on his deal. They still owe him like another 60 or $70 million. Has that done anything to back the Yankees off? I mean, that should be the same albatross contract anchor around the Yankees' neck that Cespedes is around the Mets' neck. What did the Yankees do? They went on traded for Giancarlo Stanton. They brought in the National League MVP and, oh, by the way, picked up hundreds of millions of dollars of his contract. And still, people think that once they reset the clock at 197 this year, they're going to go after Manny Machado or maybe Bryce Harper next year. Can't be in New York and act like you're in Pittsburgh. Just, you can't do it. You can't get away with it here. And they're trying, and it's not working. Let's talk to Kevin, who joins us next year on ESPN Radio. Hello, Kevin. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Good. Hey, the day the, the Mets died was the day they let Murphy go. Murphy absolutely destroyed my Cubs in the NLCS, and all he's done for the Nationals is rake since he's been there. Yeah, I mean, the Mets you had know, Justin he, Turner on their bench once, too. Well, you know, but and they also went out, if going back 30 years, you got to remember, this is a systemic issue with this ball club. They did the same thing with Bobby Bonilla. They threw a crap load of money at Bobby Bonilla to come to New York, but they never built a team. Yeah, that was quite 
And thanks for the call. Quite exactly the worst team money could buy. The biggest problem I always thought with Bobby Bonilla is they paid him to be something he wasn't. They paid him like he was a top three player in baseball, and he just wasn't that. And he was never going to live up to that money. And then, obviously, the New York media wrote him, and it went downhill from there. Anthony joins us next year on ESPN Radio. Hello, Anthony. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Um, I couldn't agree with you uh, any less than what you just already said. Uh, you, you, it, it's very simple to me. Okay. Um, the way the Mets spend their money is like this. They want to pretend that they want you to be up in the top 15, top 10, 11, so you can't say – that they're you know that they're they're cheap, but they're afraid to give commitments to people that can really help them. Like for example, you're going to give Bruce on the cheap, Fraser on the cheap, rather than get either a JD Martinez or an Eric Hosmer. To me, with money being freed up because of this insurance policy on Cespedes, there is no reason why the Mets can't be in talks. And can't be one of the teams rumored to go after Bryce Harper or Manny Machado. I There's agree with no that. Reason. You and I, you and I, absolutely, positively are on the same page where that is concerned. What I'm saying is, what what evidence do you have that they're even thinking about spending that kind of money on a superstar player? I have no evidence, and that's just a frustrating as a Mets. But you know my evidence, though. My evidence, if I want to go to a Mets a Mets game tomorrow night, uh, the tickets, everything there, that's a major market. Okay, that's, that's top of the line. So they don't really invest it as much as they said. They want to make sure, I'll give Vargas $7 million, $8 million rather than give Arietta three years, $90 million. See, it's just a cheap. And this is, what ha- this is why the Mets aren't good. It's because they do all these to these old broken up guys rather than get a, a stud in Machado who's 25, 26, or Bryce Harper in this prime. That's all they have to do. They have the pitching. I don't want them to do anything. Right now, I don't want them to get rid of Wheeler. I like the pitching. I just think if they get a couple, if they get a Manny Machado at shortstop and go get AJ Pollock in the outfield, you're telling me that team can't contend next year? Oh, Anthony, believe me when I tell you, you, you started off the call by saying you and I disagree, or you couldn't disagree more with what I said. I 100,000% endorse going out and spending money and bringing in Manny Machado. If you want to go out and sign Manny Machado, I mean, it's not my money. I would love to see Manny Machado playing in New York. There is nothing to suggest that they're going to go do that, though. So uh, the reason that I'm saying you have to look at a Syndergaard or a DeGrom trade is I am operating from the jumping-off point of Manny Machado, Bryce Harper not happening. They're not going to go out and spend that kind of money, and thanks for the call. So if I'm jumping off from they're not spending that kind of money, I'm looking at other avenues for them to improve themselves. And the only avenues I can see is taking one of those big trade chips and trading for young, controllable, affordable, cheap players. Trading for prospects, trading for like a Miguel Andujar, who is a rookie, and who now gives you five years of affordability while maybe hitting 25 home runs a year for you. If you told me they're going to go out and spend on a 250 to 300 million dollar player and that's the jumping off point, then yes, don't trade the pitchers. 100%. Keep them. Put Manny Machado at shortstop and have those two aces on the mound. Maybe Cespedes comes back at the all-star break. Maybe just having the presence of a Harper or a Machado in the lineup all of a sudden takes all the heat off of guys like Conforto, like Bruce if he comes back. You know, those guys aren't necessarily thought of as they are heart of the order, got to produce players, because they've got their franchise player. One bat like that in the middle of the lineup can have an amazing trickle-down impact on everybody else. I agree. I'm on board. Sign me up. They're not doing that, though. So if we're jumping... If the jumping off point is they are not spending that kind of money, then I have to look at what avenue I have for them to improve themselves. And the only one I see is by trading to Grom or Syndergaard. I don't see any other way they can do it. Sports fans, the sun is shining. The temps are rising. Summer is officially here. So grab your friends, blast some tunes, ignite those coals, because weather like this waits for no one. Kings for charcoal. Start something. Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Bob Oshusen in for Stephen A. More phone calls at one triple eight say ESPN one triple eight seven two nine three seven seven six. And we come back after a quick break to the top of the hour on ESPN Radio. 
guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Not all multivitamins are created equal. You should choose premium GNC multivitamins because they're clinically proven to make you feel better. Save 30% on all GNC multivitamins in-store and online Thursday through Saturday. Exclusions apply. See associate for details. Study results based on six weeks of use. And when was the last time you were at the Gamer concert? Go to vividseats.com slash ESPN today for your exclusive discount offer. Vivid Seats, the official ticket partner of ESPN. Bob with shoes and for Stephen A., one triple eight say ESPN. We'll squeeze in as many calls as we can before between now and we have to say goodbye. And let's see who's been the most patient. Brian joins us next year on ESPN Radio. Hello, Brian. Hey, what's happening? Wanted to make a quick financial note about all billionaires and millionaires that are owners. If you can show that owner that you'll spend eight hundred million dollars on players and you will not make the playoffs, in my opinion, it just makes sense that they just that's why they take five, six years off. That's why teams have these five to six year droughts. It's not by, you know, accident. I believe these owners look at the money that they're going to spend versus the money that's coming into the stadium and they do the bare minimum just But to it's put also the, the value, team. it's also the value of your organization. And thanks for the call. Like the Yankees are never taking a year off. And look at the value of their organization. They built their own television network off of never taking a year off. So, no, I don't believe that. I don't think these owners look at the balance sheet and say we're only going to try to win one out of every five years. No. Certainly didn't happen in New York. Eric joins us next year on ESPN Radio on the Stephen A. Smith Show. How are you doing? How you doing? Um, yep. So I'm a pretty big Mets fan. I remember in 2000, the Subway Series was pretty rocking. The city was on fire. I think that there should be – I think that a trade between the Mets and the Yankees really should happen at this point. I think it would be great for the city – Granted, maybe the Yankees don't want to give away great prospects to the Mets. The Mets, the back pages, the Mets don't want to see DeGrom there with, on a championship float. Sports, with the exception of really the Yankees, there's very little hope. Knicks, Nets, the Jets, re- the Giants, the Rangers are in their first rebuild, rebuild in years. I mean, I think that this can really do both teams – they both can do great here. Yeah, Eric, to me, that, you know, and again, is. like what I opened the show with – if the only reason that the Mets can come up with, and vice versa, and the Yankees as well, about not wanting to do the deal is because regardless of what, how automatically logical it seems for both teams, if the only reason that they can think of to not do the deal is they just don't want to help the other one win, then to me that's ridiculous. Like that is so short-sighted. The Yankees have a farm system that is choked with talent. So much so that they are just dumping guys off their team that they know they can't even protect on their 40-man roster. They have everything that the Mets need to reset their organization, to hit the reset button. The Mets, conversely, have exactly what the Yankees need. That front line, top of the rotation, we now have a better rotation than you, Houston, Boston, Cleveland, so on and so forth, to go along with the bullpen. If the only reason that two teams that have exactly what the other needs don't get together and talk is because they just don't want to see the other team win, to me that is beyond ridiculous and so short-sighted. That'll do it for the Stephen A. Smith Show today. Bob Wachusen in tomorrow with Kirk Morrison. Cat and Nuno up in Bristol and John Winthrop here in New York. Thanks a million. We will see you tomorrow. On ESPN Radio. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.